unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, the 10th verse. It says, if the iron be bland and he do not whet the age, then must he put more strength but wisdom is profitable to direct. I repeat, if the iron be blunt and he do not whet the edge, then must he put more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. In the simpler form of things, that if the iron or say you have a knife and the edges are not very sharp, and you're gonna cut through a piece of meat, it means that you're going to exercise more strength and energy in getting this piece of meat cut because the knife is not sharp. And so the age needs to be wet, you know, it needs to be sharpened. If it is not sharpened, it means that you will struggle. And so you have two people, for example, one is using a very sharp knife and they're cutting through a piece of meat, and another one is using a very blunt, blunt, blunt iron or knife, and they're both cutting. It means one is going to take longer, the one which is using a blunt knife, is not only going to take longer, but it's going to exert a lot of energy, a lot of strength to cut the same piece of meat, as well as the fellow who is cutting this meat with a sharp knife, he's going to cut quicker and without much strength. And God says here, the difference between the two people is wisdom. He says, wisdom is profitable to direct. We're looking at the power of wisdom in the direction we must go to make things easy for us, to make things quicker for us, to make things appear before us and work for us with little energy exerted. Hallelujah, glory to God. Now, the Bible says somewhere in Mark, the seventh chapter, the 13th verse, it says that we make the word of God of none effect because of our traditions, which were delivered by our fathers. And I'm going to begin from there. There are things that you find yourself doing, and you might never find their bearing in Scripture. But you keep on doing them because you see somebody else did it, and probably this person or this individual, you have a respect for, or perhaps they have certain results in their lives that justify them as enough to mentor or teach you or instruct you. And they also receive the same instruction from people before them. And so you find a situation where we are perhaps doing things in the body of Christ, not because we are under the impression of the Holy Spirit, not because we are under the instruction of God, but because we have inherited certain traditions. And the Bible says that even the word of God has become of none effect because of our traditions. The Bible says in Matthew 22, the 29th verse, Jesus said unto them, you do error not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He says that the very reason why we continue to err is because we do not yet know the truth as we must know it. And because we do not know the truth as we must know it, therefore we cannot demonstrate the power of God as we must demonstrate it. You see that? So the knowledge of Scripture is what allows us to access the power of God. For if power comes without knowledge, then there's a fear. There's a very misguided order of the Spirit. Back to what I'm trying to emphasize. You have had conversations in the world, unfortunately, some of them which come from even people of a faith. For example, they're talking about different aspects of life. You can say, somebody says something like, uh, you know, 
Graduating out of university is not an easy thing. And he's right, or she is right, based on their experience concerning what they have gone through concerning their education. You find somebody and they say, you know what? Marriage is hard. Marriage is not a bed of roses. It's not easy. And they are right, considering the experiences that they have gone through. Unfortunately, what is right according to individual experiences can and is oftenly imported into other people's lives. And before you know that, you know, you're in a conversation and then you hear somebody talking about somebody else's marriage that is not working. And then as they're talking about, oh, you know, this so-and-so and his wife, they're not happy. I think their marriage is almost coming to an end. And then you say something you heard your pastor say. You know, as I say, marriage is not a bed of roses. See, you have also imported it. It's now in your spirit. It's a reality. It's a seed planted in your heart. And then you're going to get married one day. And then the results of your confession are going to follow through. And when they follow through, oh, indeed, marriage is not a bed of roses. And then you teach that as well to your cousins, your siblings, and your children as well. Grow up hearing that marriage is not a bed of roses. That is something that has been handed over and over and over, over to generations until it has become an adage, a common saying, something of wisdom of some sort. And we don't examine these things, but we say them because we have heard people say them. And so we say, you know what? I think it is true. That's just how life is supposed to be. You accept it. You import something so off and so against the truth. But if we are to go back from who told, who told, who told, who told, who told, and we get to the first fellow who made that statement, we see that several generations have been affected because of one man's experience and reality. So marriage is hard. Recently, I was watching a small video, and one fellow preaching said, success is hard. If you're not ready to go the hard road, then don't dare to, you know, do success. I don't know who taught it to him, or perhaps he confirmed from his experience and reality of an affirmation that he received when he was little and growing up and he saw from people and heard from people what they said concerning success. And so he says, you know, success is hard. And so yes, he is successful, but he has had a journey of many complications. We might never know them. And so he cannot believe that there is an experience where somebody can actually be a success through easier ways, through easier means. In fact, Sam can even be so aloof and say, you know what, there's no way out. You either suffer or you don't get it. And so you import it in your heart that success is what? And many other such things concerning our finances, concerning our dreams, concerning our visions, concerning our health. Oh, the doctor said you have cancer. Oh my God. Which stage? Stage four. It's incurable. That's a conclusion. It's incurable. Oh, it's hard to cure. You know, you have to go through this process, you have to go through that process, and probably it will take you this long and that long. And of course, science and biology have their own prediction concerning what they have studied, diagonized, concerning, you know, past experiences. And it's from where they write and conclude. And then you allow your story to relate and connect to another man's testimony concerning health because you still do not know who you are <laughs> and who is in you. Somebody shout amen. Now, the reason why we're saying that, or why I'm emphasizing that is that today I want to help you understand the wisdom that directs. I want to put it in your spirit tonight and help you understand that things don't have to be so complicated for you. You don't need 70 years of hard work to break through. You don't need 13 years and 25 years to have a successful ministry. You don't need 50 years to have a successful or a breakthrough concerning your life. Some people are still believing God for breakthrough. I know people who have been praying. I know a lady one time who said, you know, I've been praying for deliverance, opposed to for 20 years concerning my family. And the family is still bound. Why? Because she does not understand the wisdom that directs. 
She does not understand the way of wisdom and its direction. And so they invest a lot of time and energy today. Let me go to this apostle. I think this won't work. Let me go to this apostle. I think this won't work. Let me go to this prophet. I think this won't work. Let me go to this pastor. Let me consult this evangelist. Or probably let me go to this woman of God. There's one which is in the cave. I'm told she's about 500 kilometers away from here. She only sees people in the morning from 8 to 9. Let me go and see her. Then somebody comes at 6 a.m. Why? Because they've been having issues in getting married. They fail to settle with any person. And so they think, you know, they is something that has refused to leave them and then you're dealing with a bunch of believers who have failed to walk in the liberty of God who saw the sun sets free that person is free indeed they're free indeed it's why we teach truth you might know the truth and the truth will make you free to walk in the freedom to stand in the liberty where with Christ has given us Somebody shout amen. And so I have refused to believe that I need 20 years because the best that I see in the world did it in 20 years. I have refused to believe that I need to do it in 10 years because the best that I know did it in 10 years. I refuse to pattern my life on the story of a man who says, you know what, there is no quicker way. You can only do this in three years. You understand? You know, you need these years. Somebody one time said, you know, Jesus needed 30 years of preparation for ministry. So if you're not 30, you cannot minister. <laughs> what a lie. What a lie. No. In fact, the very Jesus says, greater things you shall do. Greater things. You'll do greater than I have done. And so we have built principles and patterns around our own traditions, our own understanding, interpretations, and our personal experience of things, and we are determining the course and destinies of men. And that has to stop in the name of Jesus Christ. See, when the Bible speaks things like all things are possible to him that believeth, what does that mean? All things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible. It is possible for you to become a million dollars rich by tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. It is possible for you to become a billionaire in dollars by tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. It is possible for your name to become the most famous name in the world in 24 hours. The Bible says he removed sin out of the world in one day. God is not limited to how we calculate time. God is not limited to how we weigh our efforts, to how we interpret our applications. No, 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 no. That is you thinking from where you want to think from. But stop limiting God based on your thoughts. He's bigger than that. Hallelujah, glory to God. In 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, the 20th verse, it says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. You must understand these things. You must know how God works. He says, you know, be children in malice. But in understanding, he says, be ye men. Be men. Mature. You must mature in the understanding. In the way God works. When you understand how God works. When you understand how God works. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ, in only three years of ministry, has affected the world for thousands of years, more than any man that ever walked the surface of this earth. Isn't it amazing that in just three years, he affected the world in a way. He did not need 20 years. He did not need 10 years. He did not need 50 years. But when you look at the work of Christ, you'd think that this man did this for thousands of years. But in just three years only, he has made an impression. He has made an effect. He has touched the world and human race more than ever before. More than any man that ever existed. This is Jesus Christ. Three years. Just three years. Just three years. And what we have are just his miracles and his teachings. And these men just look at this man and the life that he lived and they just scribble down the stories as how they saw them. And these stories have remained sacred and have changed destinies they have lifted nations, they have sustained kingdoms, they have built empires, they've healed diseases, they've raised the dead because these guys just took an advantage 
of their observation of the man's life and they just chose to write about it. Three years only. It was enough for a man to change the world. So you don't need a whole lifetime. <laughs> you don't need 20 years. You don't need 10 years. No. And this is what I'm saying. If the very God that I'm talking about, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, resides in the inside of you, the day you leave this world, you must leave a testimony that must shake and shake and shake until the return of Christ. That must influence and influence until the return of Christ. That must impart and impart until the return of Christ. That's what Paul did. Up to today, his ministry is still alive. It has entered the hearts of men. It has pricked and convicted. It has reconciled and realigned. It has revived and reawakened. It has reformed and changed. It is still alive. It is still fresh. You open Corinthians and it's still applicable in 2021. And we cannot quote it any other way except the way Paul received it by the Spirit. Now that's glory. Shout amen. amen. So I'm not just talking about just the power to do things easy and quick, but I'm also talking about the power to have effect in your life, to have results, to have answers, to really have answers for your generation, to leave a legacy, a posterity, a certain glory in your life that will be talked about. I said, by the time I leave this world, I must leave something that will be spoken about for the rest of human existence. I will go down in the history of my continent. I'll go down in the history of the world. I have to. That's what I believe because that's what he told me. He told you in Psalms and says, ask ye of nations. He didn't say, ask for a car. Oh my God. He said, ask ye of nations and I shall give them unto you for an inheritance. I'll give the uttermost parts of the world for your possession. And you're still believing God, you know, God, I'm believing you. If I can only get 50,000 and pay this house, this landlord, only 50, Lord, 50,000. 50, oh, look at what's available for you to ask. Ask me of nations. The message version says, what do you want? Name it. Nations as a present, continents as a prize, he asks. He says, what do you want? Do you want nations? Do you want continents as a prize? You can command them to dance for you and throw them out with tomorrow's trash and still ask for more. And God still has the ability to give you, to give you more, to give you more. So if you're still believing God for rent, for a plot of land, a 50 by 100 on the earth. When God says you can ask actually of nations, then something is wrong in how you understand God. And this is a time for you to go back and dream again and redefine your aspirations. Of course, it's a step-by-step -step process, but where do you begin from? We begin from the end. That's where we begin from. I tell people we begin from the end. That's just the way of the spirit. To this end came I into this world. That's why Jesus came. He saw the end. He saw everything as it should be. And then he comes for that end. For that particular cause is into the world. Because he has seen the end. So when you say you've believed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first thing we're supposed to do is to help you have the vision of God in your spirit. And if we can take you to the end of your conversation, then you come back and start your journey as a man who knows where they are going, as a woman who knows their way. Refuse to live this life without milestones in the spirit. Now I'm giving you wisdom. The Bible says, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto your wisdom. What is the meaning of that? God has to teach you to number your days, to know how long you are on the earth. To understand your hour of opportunity, your hour of demonstration, your hour of application, your hour of submission, your hour of commitment, your hour of service, your hour of availability to God and his things. You must know how. How does Jesus know when Mary tells him to turn water into wine? How does he know that it's not yet his hour? He was not living a coincidental life. It was predicted and prophesied through his life. And that's the way of every believer. Nothing should get you off guard concerning the milestones of your destiny. And it is possible to know your life. How does Paul know that he has run his race? How does he stand before the disciples and tell them, you're not going to see me this way anymore. You shall not see me again. I'm not coming this course anymore. God has showed him how he should go. 
He has showed him his journey. He has showed him his course. He knows he's fought the fight. He, he knows, he understands when he should leave. He understands how he should leave. He has looked at what was given him according to the vision of God. You see, it's not the passive space of, you know, God, show me what I'm supposed to be and then I'll leave it and die. No, it's not in stone. It's based on the spirit of revelation. It's based on how much Christ is revealed to you. Do you know a destiny can be realigned and redrawn and redesigned? God sends a prophet to this man Ezekiah and tells him, you know what? Put your house in order. According to the ways of your life, you are done. You're supposed to die. And a man faces the wall and God changes his destiny and adds 15 years on his life because he knew how to pray. He just knew the right way to ask. What if Hezekiah had kept quiet? If he had, then he would have died that moment. He would have lost another 15 years of demonstrating the glory and power of God on the earth. So don't think that your destiny is shipped out in stone. You have to die on 12th December 2075. No, it's not like that. You number your days when you have a full revelation of Christ. The full revelation of Christ. That's when the numbering of days begins. When you have a full revelation of God, and the full purpose of God concerning the earth, then it's easy for you to number your days. And the numbering of your days begins when your part is defined. You see? Because every man has a part in the gospel. In your part are the liberties of the spirit that are available to you. That's your part. The liberties of the spirit that are available to you. How free are you? Because remember, even the Gospel of Luke says that the freedom that God sought for the deliverance of the children of Israel is that they might serve him. You are as free as you serve God. You are as free as you serve God. We even have places in human uh, history, biblical history, where God has reassigned destinies. They're discussing about the next move in the earth. And a man is seeking God and praying. And the scriptures don't tell us that he was invited. No. The Bible says as he's walking through, you know, the heavenlies and he's beholding the glory of God, he hears a conversation of Elohim. And he's saying, whom shall we send? Whom shall we send? They didn't say, our plan is to send brother so and so. No. They say, whom shall we send? Who shall go for us? Isaiah said, send me, Lord. Just send me. If that day any man in the spirit had been available in that realm of the spirit and had that same conversation, they would have taken that responsibility. Not all the purposes of God are designed around primogenitors. Yes, we have special people, primogenitors, people that come first and that tag their life is on the axis of God's purposes. You know, for a particular purpose in human history, men like Moses and the like, but you see, in the New Testament, in the New Dispensation, that changed because all of us have access to the person of the Holy Spirit. To the person of the Holy Spirit. And yes, there might be uniquenesses of the anointing operation, the administration, the demonstration of the things of the Spirit. We might be different. You see, but when it comes to touching the purposes of God, to the thing that aligns your assignment to your gifting, that sometimes seeks for men which are available. It seeks for men which are saying, God, use me. I see the need. Use me. I don't know how many are available. Use me. And sometimes God can point on certain individuals and certain people just don't do it. And a man comes and avails themselves and says, I'm available. And God will put it on that man and mandate him to do it. For example, he says the gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth and the end shall come. Now, what if I'm called to be a preacher and I refuse to be a preacher? Does that mean that the gospel is not going to be preached? No. He will raise another individual. Somebody will pick it and carry it on to the end. Somebody shout, hey man. Somebody will always pick it. It's always available. So I say the giftings and callings of God are without repentance, but the assignments and mandates of God can be switched. They can be switched. So in the New Testament, it's not entirely that because you have not done it, therefore God is not going to do it. That's not just how it works. The Spirit of God is available to convict men into the places you could ignore. 
There are men right now and women in the world who are doing things other people were supposed to be doing. There are people right now walking in the wealth other people were supposed to be walking into. There are people right now doing responsibilities that certain individuals were supposed to be doing. But they refused. They rebelled against God. And some for the love of the world, you know, distanced themselves from the responsibility of the kingdom. So it's not going to hold back God from doing what he must do because you have refused to do your part. And that is why I feel so sorry for people who have not really found themselves completely in God. Or for those which assume that they are in the perfect will of God concerning their lives and yet they are not because it's possible. I've seen it. I've seen it. This brother is so gifted or this sister is so gifted but something on her life is not it's not moving. The beauty is by faith we understand that the worlds, the eons were framed through the word. And that means if you lost it, you can ask for something again. You can ask for it. There is enough space for God to create for your eon, for your world. Even if you want to begin tomorrow, he can avail it for you to begin now. Oh yeah, I missed it. I missed my time then. Yeah. Are you still alive? Yeah. He is the God who can restore the years that were eaten by the cankerworm, by the caterpillar. He can restore it. You can start from here. <laughs> you can start from now and say, you know what, God, I was funny a couple of years ago, but now I'm ready to walk with this thing that you have called me for. And you better mean it from your heart because if you do, he's available to do it for you. God is not even limited to what he has given another man. No, he can even change the story and redesign it again for you to fit your faith according to the liberty and revelation that is available for you. So the Bible says, listen, at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. And the Bible says they should be converted and I should heal them. Once the conversion takes place, the healing of God takes place. So you are not out of time, but you are out of time if you've not come yet to this understanding or if things are already switched, you can tell. I've already spoken about the signs of an altered world. The inheritances are frustrated. The language and meaning of things, a couple of things that define an altered world. But for some of you, you're not in the world you're supposed to be in. Some of you, you are in a very different world from the world you are supposed to be in. And that is why nothing agrees with you concerning time. Everything either comes late or it does not come at all. And you don't know why. You have to be delayed at your job. Everybody you started this work with has been promoted except yourself. All your siblings have built empires except yourself. All your peers that you went to school have made it except yourself. People have gone through things and healed out of things and gone on. But you're still stuck in the same thing that you were in 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and you still don't see that there is a problem. Wisdom is profitable to direct. Somebody shout hallelujah. Wisdom is profitable to direct. It's profitable. Because time is of the essence. And no man can reconcile time in the spirit if they lack the wisdom of God. It's not possible. It's not possible. The Bible says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 15th verse, he says, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as what? wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Did you hear that? What the will of the Lord is. So you cannot talk about the redemption of time when you do not know or understand how to operate in the wisdom of God. It ain't happen that way. Those two reconcile. Any man who knows and understands how the wisdom of God works, that man knows how to redeem time, according to how much wisdom is revealed to him. One time a fellow started attacking us as a ministry online. He said, did I believe in us as a ministry? And somebody asks him, why don't you believe in this ministry? And he says, it's not possible to raise a thousand members every year. It's not possible. So that was his problem. We were still in the third year. 
And now that has even become bigger. Yes, we said to see we're raising slightly above a thousand members every year. And so he says, it's not possible to raise a thousand members every year. He's even a little kid. He's young. How can he be doing that? We have served God, he said, for more than 30 years, he said. <laughs> and I think his membership was, I think some, even two or 300 members. So I'm wrong because I did not go his way of results. And so I'm to be blamed. He's not supposed to believe in the testimony of God operating on my life because I'm supposed to walk his way and his story. Because the problem with Christianity is everybody thinks they are wise in their own way. Everybody thinks they have an answer in their own way. Everybody thinks that they have a solution in their own way. Everybody thinks that their answer and solution is the best. That there is no people out there in the world that have more or have been exposed to more just because they do not know them or they actually do not know how God works. I told people once that God does not need to take away from you to raise the standards of every eon. Every generation is raised into a certain standard of glory and he does not need to take away from a man. And one time I gave an example and I said there was a time in this nation where an acre of land would be almost the price of a dollar, a United States dollar, one dollar would buy you an acre of land. There was a time in this nation where one dollar would buy you two or three acres of land. You see? But now it might not even get a man a meal. You see? So if one man stayed in that eon, in that world, in that period, in that age, it means that in 2021, their relevance is rubbed from the face of the earth. Think about it. So you have people living in the grace and glory of an age 30 or 40 years back. Some are living in a glory of five years back. Everything about you is five years back. If you have to buy a phone, it has to be three or four years old. If it has to be a car, some of you have to buy a car 10 or 15 years back because that's where you really are. It's the only way you can afford it. Why aren't you buying the latest in the name of Jesus Christ? What did he make it for? He says, whether things present or things to come. He has even pointed in the future. He says, all are yours and you are Christ. So why should you feel sorry for having the latest phone? Or why do you think it's wrong for a believer to have the latest phone? If it's not their God, if it's not an idol, if it's not a Baal to them, it's not wrong. Because it gives us all things to enjoy. Hallelujah, glory to God. Somebody shout amen. amen. I refuse to walk in an old glory. I refuse to function in the glory of old ages. I refuse to function in inferior eons, in eons that are so past that their glory is not recognizable in the time that I'm living in. I refuse to be that. I refuse to live that way. In the mighty name of Jesus, somebody say amen. amen. That's what some people are. But tonight it's changing in the name of Jesus. I said tonight it's changing in the name of Jesus. In Colossians, the fourth chapter, the fifth verse, it says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And again, it said, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. And not only does this thing waste time, it worries the spirit. It worries the soul. That is why some people are so tired early. You're 35, but you feel like you've been working for 72 years. You're 22, but your body feels like it has been working for 40 years. Today we find people at the age of 20 who have diseases of people which are 80. You find people in their 30s and 40s as weak as people who are 80 and 70. You are 35, but you're feeling like you're 90 years old. Something is broken in you. There's a certain wisdom you need. One great man told me something. He said, for every grace in which God will raise you, for every glory in which you will walk, it shall and must come with the strength to sustain you in your youthfulness that it might not overwhelm you. For wherever you sense an overwhelming concerning the glory and the responsibilities of the Spirit, question the wisdom in which you move. Remember the book of Acts, how the Grecians, you know, have war with the Hebrews. The Jews. Why? Because 
the wives of the Grecians are being ignored in the distribution of food, and it becomes a big war in the early church. Have you thought about it that actually food was available? That their confusion was not because of the scarcity of food, but in the wisdom to be able to distribute to everyone as they ought to have? Do you see that it was not a time of famine? Do you see that it was not a time of lack? It was actually a time of abundance, but there was a wisdom that was necessary to distribute food the right way. So sometimes when we increase, when we multiply, when we grow, if we do not have the wisdom to bureaucratize the movements of the spirit, sometimes we spoil and bring to the death of some of these movements early, some of these graces early, of some of these blessings early, of some of these glories early, of some of these breakthroughs early. Sometimes we kill them. The early church could have split where the power of the Holy Spirit was, where the ministers of God were, where everything was, if they had not understood how to distribute food. Do you know that? Do you know that the church was going to break because of food? Because of the availability of food? They didn't lack food. No, they just didn't know how to deal with the distribution of food. There was just the necessity of wisdom. So he has to get seven men full of wisdom and of the Holy Ghost that they might distribute food. And how many things have broken churches? Some churches have broken because of food. Basic food. Some ministers are broken because of equipment. Lights, cameras. Some ministries are broken because of choirs, just because there's just so many people to choose from and they don't have the wisdom to know how to deal with it. Some businesses are broken because of many customers. The customers became so overwhelming that I did not have the wisdom to know how to deal with these numbers. And I was not willing to apply myself to that wisdom. I know a person who started a business a couple of years ago when I was little, and this person grew with their business very successfully. And another person a couple of years started the same business, and this was the leader in the same business. And a couple of years, I saw this business die as the customers continued to increase. And I saw this business become an empire as the customers continued to increase. Because when the money came in for both of them, everyone saw money differently. Everyone saw customers differently. These two people saw increase differently. There are people who are just $20,000 away from death. If they just get $20,000, they can die. They can make a decision that can kill them. $20,000. And there's a man who has power to contain a billion dollars, to contain billions of dollars. And he's still a normal fellow putting on a t-shirt and a jean and he's walking those streets very normal. Wisdom is profitable to direct. But above all, like I said, there's that which now brings the weariness. It tires you more than just the wastage of time because some of you have lost a lot of time and I don't even know how you're going to redeem it. Some of you, you even sat under the wrong teachers for many years. That which you call wisdom was not wisdom. It was killing you. You are being planted in death every morning. Starved and your soul was bleeding every day. But you're seated in front of a shepherd. And now you don't even know how to listen and discern truth. It's hard for you to discern truth because you don't even know the difference anymore. Your experiences have not been kind to you. But I'm talking about also the weariness. You get tired. Some people are so tired. The people who look so tired. Ecclesiastes, again, that 10th chapter, five verses down, the 15th verse, it says that the labor of the foolish weareth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. You see, he is wearied because he knoweth not. He's wearied because he knoweth not. You are tired of your marriage because maybe you don't know how to run that marriage. You're tired in your ministry because you don't know how to go in and to go out. You don't know how the way of the Spirit works. You don't know how ministry works. But you cannot even admit that you don't know. You're so proud to humble yourself to learn. And every day things are falling around you. They're dying every day. There are people who are tired. They are tired. I know pastors who, if they were given an opportunity, if their calling was like a job, they would quit. In fact, now they say in the United States, I was reading something the other day. <laughs> People are quitting the gospel like nothing. They're quitting every day. 
There are pastors quitting every day. Every day. Every day. They're quitting the gospel. How can they quit this thing? How? How has the devil done this to them? And not only that, Europe. Go to places of Europe. It's a rare thing in Africa, you know. I'm not saying this in any way to judge. No, we actually have to take heed, least we ourselves <laughs> lose it. You see what I'm saying? So God wants to not only make things easy for you, but he wants to give you the energy of those things. And that is why every morning I always say to myself that I have the strength to do everything that God has accorded for me to do in the mighty name of Jesus. And I have it because I have the wisdom of building it. I have the wisdom of preserving it. I have the wisdom of sustaining it. Even if I sleep for two or three hours in one day, I'll still wake up stronger because I'm not subject to science. I'm subject to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? I'm subject to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles, the 12th chapter, 32nd verse says, and of the children of Ishakar, the Bible says there were men which had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And the number of them, the Bible says, was 200. And look at what happens. The Bible says, and all their brethren were at their commandment. That's what this thing does. Once you understand it, God will put you over men. You see, I've been mentioning a few days ago how to have power over men. Because it's not a place of manipulation. It's not a place of controlling. It's not a place of selfishness. It's a place of sacrifice and death to the self and submission to the will of God because as he's lifted, he draws men to himself. Now, there it is for the minister. He says, if you have understanding of the signs of the times, when you get to know how and what to do, when the wisdom of what to do comes, you don't need to look for men. They will come to you because the world is full of questions. The world is full of trouble. The world is full of challenges. The world is full of testations. And so, submit yourself to truth and refuse to submit to the traditions. You refuse to yield yourself to anything that is not aligned to truth, even if the person who does it you believe in so greatly. But if it's contrary to truth, don't go the way that is contrary to truth. Don't. It's like one time somebody called me and said, I need a prayer, I'm sick. She had a stomach issue, she was in pain and stuff like that. And then on the phone I said, you're healed in Jesus' name, amen. So this person keeps waiting. I tell him, have a good day. Thank you, Apostle. And after a few minutes, she calls back, kru, kru. Apostle, there's a way I wanted you to pray. <laughs> You've not prayed it. Let's pray now. And I told this dear lady and I said, look, who told you that we need to pray a certain way, the way you want us to pray, to have the answer that you're believing God for? Why did you call me if you knew how to pray? I asked her, why did you call me if you knew how to pray? Look at Jesus Christ as the social and spiritual experience. He goes to a child which is dead cold from head to toe. But the iron is sharp. Talitha Kumai. Little girl in our mic, rise up. That is it. And that lifeless body receives life. The blood starts to flow. The heart starts to pump. And she came to life again. He just said, Talitha Kumai. They bring a man crippled, sick. He looks at this man and says, get up. Take your bed and walk. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's the son of God. That's the one who is living in the inside of you. Because the iron was sharp. Remember, he likens us to iron. Iron sharpeneth iron. So the continents of one man another, you see? But he, he was wet. He says the word of God, the word of God, he says, is sharper than a double-edged sword. And who is the word? Jesus, thank you. He's the word that has become flesh. So look at how the word of God works. He gets to a sick man, heals. 
and immediately healing happens. He gets to a dead body, rise up, and it's up. You know, he gets to a blind man, open your eyes, stop. He just touches the he's sick and oh my God, look at how Jesus heals. Just look at how Jesus heals. And then look at how the tradition of our churches to them. Father, 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 Sharababakota. Jesus, he says, you're like the heathen. They repeat themselves over and over as though they think that when they scream, they will be heard. I refuse to be like that in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout amen. And I've realized that when you learn to sharpen your iron, when you learn to align yourself to the word of God, miracles are effortless. Effortless. I told a story one time of a lady who came to me and said she had spent eight years barren. Since marriage, eight years, she didn't have a child. So I say, go have children. Amen. She waits. And she sees, I'm done. I'm walking away. Pastor, we have not prayed. And I said, what didn't you get? I just said, go have children. Because I know what's upon me. I know who is in me. I know what he anointed me for. I feel it. It's in my system. I'm not faking it. I'm not acting it out. I know from the authority from which I speak. And two, three months later, she's conceived. And she had a child. You see that? I remember another one somewhere in Mokono. And I see a lady and I say, I see you have a sister who is barren. She says, yeah. So I meet her one of those days. Oh, this is my sister you said was barren. I said, yeah, you're going to have a male child. I walked away. Amen. And that was it. A couple of months later, conceives a male child. Listen, when you know how to sharpen your eye and you don't need to exercise and exert too much energy and time on something of whose will concerning God is revealed. When it comes to healing, heal. Some of you have been with us on crusades, you know what happens. And now I decree and I declare, blind eyes are opening. I don't even need to say blind eyes open. No, I say they are opening. They must hear me and open. Somebody shout hallelujah. And I say there's somebody, you had a tumor, it's disappearing right now. And it has to hear me because I've said it. Anything that knows it's a tumor, it must know that I have spoken. Somebody shout amen. amen. Shout amen. That is why on healing crusades, I preach not more than 30 minutes. Because I just need to get the hearts, most importantly to salvation. Because that's the greatest miracle. And when we get to the healing, it's like frying popcorn. It's easy. They pop, and that's how it's supposed to be. Get to a level where your iron is so sharp. Are you hearing me? That a devil comes and you tell it, I don't have your time. And indeed, you don't have its time. You will never go on your knees again to speak to it. Somebody shout hallelujah. With your axe so sharp, your iron so sharp, that you'll get to disease, feel a pain in your body and say, hey! And that's it. We don't even need to discuss it. It's done. We don't add. We don't say anything more than that. It's gone. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's where God wants us to be. Be healed. Be free. Your business is going to succeed. It's done in the name of Jesus Christ. Your husband is coming back tomorrow at 8 a.m. It's done in the name of Jesus. And when we do that, they say, oh my God, this man is a prophet. <laughs> No, it's the authority of the new birth. He says, you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. Many of these things are not in the realm of prayer, actually. No, 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 they're not in the realm of prayer. They're in the realm of decreeing. They're in the realm of you speaking forth and you believe your word that you have spoken it. One time I found people casting out devils. Go, 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 go. The whole night they were casting out one devil out of one girl and she had beaten everyone. You see? Why are they fighting to kill something? And I go to the thing, I tell you, see, I'm not in the mood. And the demon said, okay. He left. Hallelujah, glory to God. Glory to God. That's the mystery of faith. That's the mystery of faith. You must believe that you are what everything God has said you are. And you have everything God has said you have in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to pray with you right now. Raise your hands and we pray together. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to decrease some things right now in the name of Jesus. There's a wisdom right now that is available to direct you. It's the sunesis 
that critical faculty of Sophia, the wisdom of God that gives you the mind of God concerning a thing and that the yoke of the Christ is light. Can you speak into your destiny? Speak into your life. Come on, raise your voice and start to pray. I decree and I declare that marriages are restored in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that the sick are healed in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that the dumb are speaking in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that tumors are living in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that cancers are living in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that your finances are being aligned right now in the name of Jesus. I see a great ministry in somebody's life right now in the name of Jesus. And I see that it is springing forth a couple of months from now in the name of Jesus. Jesus. And I see that your name is going to be known in the whole world shortly in the name of Jesus. Riba Shande Kosata Bakatere Broza Zireki Brosanto Ricata Bracando Sabreke Telema Cobrase Lele Sile Proconda Casite Nekire Broza Lamanta Rica Zele Broza Riba Shonta Carica Terebra Sile Mayebo Salabayere Corando Ribo Sele Hashari Katoriba, may things work easy for you. May things be simple for you. May things come quickly for you. May you redeem time in the name of Jesus. And may you walk in the strength of God. May you never grow weary in the mighty name of Jesus. May you stand where others fail. May you succeed where others fail. May you be established where others fail. In the name of Jesus, may you blossom in the desert in the name of Jesus and may you be raised high in the valley. I decree and I declare in the name of Jesus that divine strength in its manifestation is yours. People are going to see a power that is not ordinary. People are going to see a power that is not human. People are going to see a power that is not scientific. People are going to see a power that is not mathematic. People are going to see a power that cannot be physical. It must be spiritual. In the mighty name of Jesus now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which you dare to ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. Tell that power in you to bring something that has not been seen. Sapa katarapa rima zobra kanda zeprike telepa serima telebo Rima sopra cando, rima seribo zalando hosa, sa celebrando robo, zire ke bracando zilaba, kipo rinda rita laba. And I want you to give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Come on, clap, 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 clap for Jesus. Clap like you know that God has done it. Clap like you know that it is finished. Come on, clap your hands to Jesus. Clap your hands. Give him a thank you. 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 By faith, you're sharpened. By faith, your precision is clear. Maka brendo ziba. Sande ho shitaba. Oh, it's the word of God working in your life. It's the word of God working in your life. It's the word of God working in your life. It never fails. Even when things are complicated, it still breaks through. Even when things are hard, it still finds a way. Even when it's impossible, it still creates possibility. I will never fail. Say it. Say I will never fail. In the name of Jesus. I cannot die before my time. Say it. In the name of Jesus. Say I cannot be frustrated. Say it. Say everything I do happens quickly. Say everything I touch. It must turn to what I aspire it to be. In the name of Jesus. Say I will never be slowed. Say I will never be frustrated. I will never be disappointed. Say I will never be put to shame. Because greater is he which is in me. Than he that walketh in the world. 
whatever the enemy aims for bad my God is going to turn into good he beautifies my story he beautifies my ministry he beautifies my language he beautifies my vision he beautifies my business he beautifies my marriage he beautifies my dream he beautifies my aspirations he beautifies my commitments in the mighty name of Jesus. Give the Lord again a mighty hand of praise with a shout and say hallelujah. It is mine. I receive it. 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 I receive it in Jesus mighty name. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You say these words. You say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you shed your blood for me and was raised for my glory. Now tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.